BAHs and C60 that you see over there. Um, but then when you go to the, the denser clouds, uh, that's where you start to see the molecular complexity, uh, long carbon chains, saturated molecules, water, of course, a uh, very prominent role in all of this. Uh, then you go to the disk stage, when the envelope has dissipated, you have a, a young star who is still surrounded by its uh, uh, disk, uh, in which the planets uh, may form. Uh, and that's where we have yet another chemistry. And finally, we get to a mature solar system with planets, but also with comets. And uh, thanks to the Rosetta mission, we have had an incredibly exciting time, actually, uh, with uh, uh, making the comparison with, uh, with comets. So what you see here already is that physics and chemistry are interlinked. UV radiation temperature really determine the abundances of the molecules. And that's good, because that means we have specific molecules actually under specific conditions, and we can use them as diagnostics, not just chemistry, but also physics. If we look at the same stages again, then much of the molecular complexity is actually what we call in the embedded phase of star formation. Uh, that's where we have the, the young disks, um, whereas the mature disks are then the next stage, also called sometimes the class two stage. But we have not just molecules in the gas, we of course have the, the, the dust that plays a very important role, and the ices. And we now know that these ices start to form already in the diffuse uh, translucent stage, um, and then become more and more complex uh, when you get to the higher densities, uh, when you have the heavy freeze out of carbon monoxide on the grains that can be turned actually into, into methanol. And then all of this can eventually be incorporated into the uh, planetesimals, the, the, the pebbles, that are actually forming then uh, along these stages. And one thing that we have learned over the last few years is basically that this stage is happening already earlier and earlier in the embedded stage of star formation. And so this is why if you want to study the uh, sort of the chemistry of planet formation, you have to go back also to these very early stages. So some of the questions that uh, we've been trying to address over the years are how, where, and when are molecules like water, complex molecules formed? Are they preserved from cloud to disk? Or are they reset by, say, accretion shocks? And then what are the processes that then ultimately control the chemistry in the planet forming zones? And especially in that last uh, part, is of course where we've had the whole ALMA revolution uh, with these uh, increasingly intriguing and beautiful images here in the millimeter continuum um, of uh, a number here, just a subset of potentially planet forming disk. This is work from uh, Nienke van der Marel uh, that you see over here. But the lesson that we get from all of these images is that the bulk of them seem to have a lot of structure or substructure uh, in them. And that actually turns out to play a very significant role. So, spoiler alert, what are the answers to these questions? Um, where are the molecules formed? Mostly at the early stages. We have to go back already to the very early, possibly pre-stellar stages before the cloud collapses. Uh, that's where the bulk of the molecules uh, and complexity is already uh, in place. Are they preserved? We think largely yes. Uh, what are the processes that control that chemistry? Well, these dust traps that you see here, that so in these ALMA images, and also snow lines play a very significant role in determining the uh, outcome. But the bottom line is there's a very interlinked chemistry and physics, both in the gas and the ice. And so you need to know both of them, the gas and the ice. So let's start actually with the, the young disks. And uh, this is one of my favorite star-forming regions of Yucas, and there is a tiny little uh, protostar in there called IRS 16293 that we have been studying already for several decades. What ALMA brings now to the table is really precision astrochemistry. So in the past, we were always suffering from beam dilutions and being forced to look at optically thick lines. Now we really uh, are resolving the structures and we can see the optically thin lines, the isotopologues, uh, that can give us really very accurate abundance ratios. And also an incredible sensitivity. We see species down to about 10 to minus 11 with respect to H2. Um, so again, we have a huge dynamic range actually to work with. Now this uh, source was uh, studied for, for the first time on solar system scales actually in the so-called PILS survey that was led by uh, Jess Jurgensen from uh, Copenhagen. Um, this source is actually a, a proto-binary. It's uh, uh, two stars 
typically only half a solar mass, uh, that are actually forming a few hundred AU apart. Um, and you see that one of them is a, uh, a nearly so a phase on disk and the other one has a more in inclined disk. But we can now actually study the chemistry on scales of say the orbit of Uranus uh, equivalent in these uh, forming solar systems. And just to give you an impression, these are incredibly rich uh, spectra. Uh, this is just one of the 10 ALMA bands uh, that we have and already there, we have some 10,000 lines. Uh, approximately one every three kilometers per second. And of course, we have not just spectra, we have images of all of these 10,000 lines. So you can already imagine that this is a, a data set that kept us uh, uh, quite uh, busy. Um, more than 100 different molecules were found, just to give you a few highlights. Um, here we see that there are also not just dicarbon molecules, but we are going now to tricarbon molecules. Propanol is seen, but no propanol and propinol. Uh, so very interesting also for the, the chemist among you, uh, uh, the differentiations in the, the, the various uh, molecules. But also interesting uh, CNO bonds. Uh, those are the beginnings of, say, peptide bonds. Uh, so that's why these are called uh, prebiotic molecules. A nice work done by Niels Lichtering here, uh, also on uh, some other interesting uh, prebiotic molecules like acetamide and glycolonatrile. Although uh, the simplest amino acid, glycine, has not yet been detected here. In all of this work, there has been a, a very close collaboration with the Leiden Laboratory for Astrophysics, um, where we also simulate the, uh, um, the processes that are happening actually in space. Now, this was one source. And you may say, well, what is one source? Is How unique is that? Thanks to ALMA and its sensitivity, we can now actually go to large samples. And this is just one example. You can take any combination of molecules, uh, but this is a, a good uh, uh, um, a case that you see here of some, some cyanides, uh, where we have not just uh, results here for the low mass sources like IRS 16293, but also for a whole series of high mass sources uh, from the, the, actually the ALMA archive, the, the ALMA call survey. And what you see is that in spite of the fact that we have you know, seven orders of magnitude in luminosities, the abundance ratios are actually very similar. And this is one of the arguments that really points to the formation in a common physical environment. Cannot be um, large changes in terms of temperatures and UV. Uh, and that then in turn turns, uh, points to a formation in a, a pre-stellar phase already under rather similar uh, conditions. There's another argument that points to the inheritance uh, that I just discussed, and that is water. I could give a whole talk just about water and one of my favorite molecules. Uh, and what you see here in the bottom is uh, the little movie that we made on how we now think that the bulk of the water is actually formed in space. Uh, it's actually formed on the surfaces of the grains with hydrogen and oxygen atoms actually uh, scanning the surface and meeting each other and, and forming the bonds. And this has been simulated in the laboratory. It has been proven observationally and also uh, shown uh, theoretically. But it's not water itself, it's actually the deuterated forms of water that tell us most about the uh, evolution and the inheritance of water. And what you see here in the right hand uh, slide is actually HDO uh, over water. And what you're comparing here is actually a number of these protostar envelopes like IRS 16293, now in comparison with a number of comets. And the bottom line is actually that within factors of two, all of these numbers are actually very similar uh, between protostars and comets, and all of them are at least an order of magnitude higher than the overall D to H ratio that you have in the, um, uh, in the interstellar medium and in the, in the universe. Uh, but even stronger arguments come from doubly deuterated water, <laughs> truly heavy water, D2O, um, because that is uh, relatively even more enhanced, and that is really a signature of very low temperature chemistry that happens in that very early stage. Um, and that is uh, sort of one of the clues that we now have, and also its similarity again with uh, uh, the, the Rosetta mission comet 67P, uh, that similarity that points to the inheritance. So we talked about young disks, uh, like IRS 16293. They are warm. This is a temperature structure derived uh, for it. You see that everywhere it's, it's, it's largely above 100 Kelvin, which means that water cannot freeze out, and also the complex organics are actually in the, in the gas phase. 
But if you go to the later stages, the disk actually become colder and colder. And uh, that means that uh, more and more molecules start to freeze out, first the water, but eventually even the carbon monoxide starts to freeze out. And so young disks are very line rich. Mature disks are actually very difficult to observe, only very few lines. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that the molecules are absent. They are just simply hidden in the ices. And this brings me actually to the importance of snow lines. Here you see a beautiful example here of uh, some of the Bolivian uh, uh, mountains. Um, and here we see our snow line. Um, this is where it is in the gas. Uh, that is what we observe in the millimeter with, uh, with Alma. But here it is in the ice. And that we observe in the infrared. Um, ice cannot rotate, but it can vibrate. So that brings us to the infrared. And that is exactly where JDBST will come, uh, come in. Now, Karen Oberg and uh, Ted Bergen actually pointed out that uh, if you think about ices, then they are always oxygen rich. Because CO2 has two carbons, sorry, two oxygens, one carbon, and water, of course, has one oxygen, no carbon. So ices are always oxygen rich, which means that the gas is actually going to be uh, uh, carbon rich. And that's a function of position because as if you go further away in the disk, then of course it becomes colder and you cross all of these snow lines, first the water snow line, most tightly bound, and then the least, the more, the more volatile molecules like carbon monoxide uh, in, the, uh, in the outside. Um, so that means that if you have a giant planet that would actually be forming here in the outside and it would get most of its heavy elements from accretion of the gas, it should have a high carbon over oxygen ratio and a low C over H ratio. And that would be a characteristic. Of course, if you form it much more further in, then it would have a, a very different uh, composition. Now that's the simple picture. But that simple picture is complicated by the fact that we have these icy dust grains and they can actually move due to the headwinds between the, uh, the, the, the gas and the dust. Uh, they actually migrate actually through the disk and they can end up even in the, in the star. And once they pass their snow lines, they will start to sublimate these, these ices back into the gas phase. So you actually start to enhance carbon and oxygen in the inner disk thanks to these drifting pebbles from the uh, cold outside. So we have now a structure that looks something like this, where we have uh, icy rich uh, pebbles here in the inner disk, um, inside or outside uh, certain snow lines. Uh, that gives us high C over H and, and O over H in the inner disk. And we have gas in the outer disk that is um, uh, depleted overall in carbon and oxygen, but uh, more in oxygen than in carbon, so it has a C over O greater than unity. And this is actually a situation that is observed for many disks. In fact, the lockup of water into icy grains was something uh, that came rather unexpectedly from the Herschel High Farm mission when we were trying to observe water in disks. And actually, uh, we have these beautiful detections here of water in the TW Hydro disk. Uh, but that was one of the few disks. The most of the disk was incredibly uh, weak. Um, and so from the strength of these lines, we can determine the amount of water that we actually have in the uh, um, the number of water molecules that we have in the disk, uh, corresponding in this case to some 6,000 oceans. Uh, but actually most of that is locked up in the icy pebbles. Uh, the lines are much weaker than expected, uh, and so uh, we basically cannot, uh, cannot see them. And so this is also leads to one of my uh, famous sayings, <laughs> that most of the new information, most of the, what you actually learn in science is actually hidden in the weak lines, not in the strong lines. Forget about those. Go for the weak lines. Uh, that's where you find your new, uh, your new science. The same actually holds for uh, carbon monoxide. Um, we were thinking and uh, anticipating that it would be easy with ALMA to detect uh, carbon monoxide in disks. And this is one of the few hundred disks that we uh, have observed with uh, ALMA a strong continuum, and in this case, a reasonably strong carbon monoxide as well. But the bulk of the few hundred disks are actually incredibly weak in carbon monoxide. Very strong here in the continuum, but almost absent uh, 13CO in this uh, case. Pointing to the fact that just like water, the CO is actually locked up in icy pebbles very early on and also partially transformed into methanol and CO2 processes that we actually also simulated in the, in the laboratory. Now, how do we test this? Well, we can test it with a molecule that is actually sensitive to this carbon depletion. And that's C2H, has two carbon atoms, so it's very sensitive to how much carbon you have in the gas. 
This is the case where we actually detect no C2H. Uh, what you see here is the continuum. Uh, but these are two other disks, almost no CO, uh, but very strong C2H. Um, and that is a, a condition that, that clearly points, uh, implies high carbon over oxygen ratio, uh, even though it is a lo rather low carbon uh, abundance. So a very nice diagnostic of what is going on. So we have observational proof of, uh, of sort of this picture, uh, but then, you know, <laughs> this was for a smooth disk. Uh, now we know that we have these structured disks. We have these dust traps that actually lock up these uh, oxygen-rich icy pebbles. And so that means that now we will actually have a low carbon and oxygen abundance in the inner disk. And we will find, form a totally different atmosphere of a planet. So the composition of a giant planet ultimately depends on where it is with respect to the presence of dust traps and whether those dust traps are inside or outside the various uh, snow lines. So how do we then observe that icy reservoir in disks? Because that's obviously where a lot of things are happening. Well, you can be lucky and have an outbursting source. Um, and then actually the snow line moves outward and the lines become a lot brighter. Uh, there's one source that we know that uh, where this is happening and that has been a wonderful uh, sort of laboratory for studying the chemistry in disks uh, that we see uh, over here. Another case is looking in more detail at those dust traps and especially the edges of the dust traps uh, where actually the ices can sublimate because the, the dust gets somewhat warmer at the edges of the dust traps and can actually sublimate back into the, to the gas phase. And Alice Booth will give a nice talk about that actually on, uh, on Thursday. Um, and then the third option is actually to observe these ices in absorption in edge on disks where we can look sort of along the line of sight towards the continuum. And this is really uh, one of the goals of several uh, JWST uh, programs. So let's go back to our uh, gallery and let's look at one of our favorite uh, objects here, IRS-48, one of the first disks uh, that was uh, uh, detected as a, as a dust trap and proven to be a, uh, a dust trap, a very asymmetric one that you see uh, over here in the millimeter continuum. Uh, but with a normal gas disk, uh, with of course a cavity in it uh, that you see around it, it's uh, inclined by about 50 uh, degrees. But that's carbon monoxide. Now let's look at other molecules formaldehyde, SO2, SO, methanol, uh, even other molecules. You see that they are not symmetric. They are actually sitting here, offset from the star. They are sitting here exactly on that dust trap. Um, and so that means that this dust trap is not just a dust trap. It's really an ice trap. And that ice trap is actually starting to sublimate here and uh, bring the molecules back into the gas phase uh, exactly uh, uh, at that edge. And we can now also determine the composition of it. By luck, uh, we have uh, uh, two ratios that, uh, where you can either uh, cross out the S or you can cross out the N, and you have O over C, and you find actually that this is a high O over C or a low C over O, which is exactly what you expect for uh, sublimating ices. So in contrast with other disks, this is really a case where we have the sublimating ices disks, which we're seeing then. So this is a, a, a very nice laboratory and more work is, is going on on this. Uh, we dug a little bit deeper into this uh, data set with a master student, Ashanti Brunken, and found uh, not just methanol, but even the most complex molecule to date in a uh, disk, uh, which is uh, dimethyl ether, nine uh, atoms. And this was uh, highlighted in an ESO press release, actually on International Women's Day, because this was a, a paper that actually had six female authors uh, on it. Um, the fact that the abundance is so high and also the abundance ratios point again to the fact that the comms are largely inherited from the cold pre-stellar uh, phase. And you see these molecules happily dancing uh, over there. Good, so building planets in disk, what is the composition of the material? Well, uh, Alma uh, is doing the outer disk. JWST is going to do the ices in the outer disk, in the edge on case, and it's going to do uh, the, uh, the gas in the, uh, in the inner disk. And so there's a real synergy here between JWST and ALMA because only together is when they give uh, actually the, the picture. Now web data are coming soon. We've had a beautiful launch, the, the farewell uh, to web, a uh, very emotional moment when we saw that on Christmas Day. Uh, and also a very emotional moment for me because uh, I've been part of uh, JWST uh, for some 25 years, uh, part of the MIRI consortium that actually built 
uh, that instrument in the consortium uh, partnership with the US, and you will hear a talk by Luis Colina uh, later on it. Uh, but I'm very proud of the whole team. Uh, everything seems to be working well, and uh, a part of the spectrometer main optics were actually built in uh, the Netherlands. Um, so we actually have several guaranteed time programs exactly centered on both the early stage and the, the mature stage, uh, the protostars and uh, the disks. Um, and uh, also there are several uh, other programs in which we are heavily involved and that we're looking forward to in, in order to characterize both the ISIS but also some of the physical structure. One of these programs, uh, ERS programs on uh, uh, ISIS is actually the Ice Age led by my colleague uh, Melissa McClure um, uh, from Leiden and uh, she is actually uh, tracing also the, the, the composition of ISIS across the different uh, stages, including these edge on disks uh, where we may actually see these molecules uh, uh, in, in absorption and even map them against uh, the scattered light. For all of this, you also need the spectra, of course, the laboratory data, and for that, uh, already for several decades, we have the Leiden uh, ICE database, and uh, now being completely updated and revived uh, under the leadership of Harold Linnard, and uh, stay tuned uh, uh, shortly for uh, all, of that, uh, all of that data. If we look at the inner disk, so this was the cold outer disk. If you look at the inner disk, that's where the temperatures are high. That's where you have a high temperature chemistry, uh, gas emission from gas that is several hundred Kelvin. And we expect a very rich spectrum to see there. Lines like these that uh, Spitzer absolutely could not see uh, before. So here we'll be probing directly the gas actually that makes planets in the inner few astronomical units and be able to uh, make an inventory of carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, especially since we're observing some of the major species that we see there. So to summarize, I think we are now firmly into the era of from disks to planets. <laughs> we started from clouds to disks, uh, but now we are definitely in the era of from disks to planets. And it's a fascinating story that is uh, uh, um, uh, unfolding, actually, uh, especially the realization uh, that much of it is set in the early stage, but then uh, the structure of the disks actually uh, determines, in, to some degree, the outcome of the, the type of planets, gas giants, ice giants, terrestrial, that you form, especially the location of these dust traps with respect to the ice lines. That, of course, also then implies that, in principle, you can, uh, as an ultimate goal, use chemistry as a probe of the formation location and the history of the mature planets. And this is, of course, where the exoplanets and disk communities will greatly uh, uh, collaborate in the coming years. I would like to end with a few other uh, slides, um, because also my leadership in the astronomical community was mentioned, and it has been really my privilege uh, to serve as the president of the International Astronomical Union for three years. Um, and the IEU and EES, of course, have a, a common goal, namely to bring people together worldwide. And we see how important it is to meet in person and to exchange ideas and to get to know each other. And we do that with the IEU uh, only once every three years, but then we really try to get together for two weeks and uh, bring uh, the worldwide uh, community together. And I hope to meet at least several of you also in Busan uh, next uh, month. But the IU uh, and the EAS do so much more these days than just having scientific conferences. Um, it's also our, 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 our basically our, our, our obligation as astronomers to contribute to education, to training, to development. And the IU just does it several ways, through schools for young astronomers, hands-on training at, data, at telescopes, teacher training, development, uh, etc. And so in our new strategic plan, uh, we not only have the, uh, the central IAU part, but we have our four offices. The Office for Young Astronomers, for training, for development in Cape Town, for communication in Tokyo, and for education, our latest kit on the block here um, close by in, in Heidelberg. Um, and each of these uh, um, offices also have their regional um, offices. And uh, here you see them for the astronomy for development. So this is not development of astronomy, but this is really using astronomy as a tool for development in order to make, uh, um, uh, to make the world a little better. As uh, in the words of uh, Kevin Goffeter, uh, that, you see, uh, that you see how can we use astronomy to make the world a better place. And one of these offices is actually in Europe. And that is uh, a very fruitful collaboration between the EES 
and actually IEU in Leiden, my uh, home institution. And so here you see the signing of that with uh, the president, uh, Roger Davies, uh, there. Also, Minister Pandor uh, from South Africa was there. So it was a, a very uh, um, a good moment uh, to, uh, to start this also in Europe. Let me answer a little story about, uh, about bubbles. Uh, I think since COVID, we all know about bubbles. Uh, bubbles are small groups that only interact with each other, but not with the rest of the world. I think one of the roles of the EAS and IAU is to take you outside your bubbles, your national bubbles, your regional bubbles, your scientific bubbles. This is what all of these big meetings are about uh, in order to, to learn about other topics. And uh, I think we have to continue to cherish this and, uh, and promote this and realize the, the important value of this. So there are other kinds of bubbles as well, and I hope that tonight <laughs> we will having some bubbles uh, there and that all of you will be celebrating actually uh, uh, the science that we are having here uh, this week. So let me uh, end here and thank you again for the incredible honor. And let me just say that it is a uh, really uh, uh, a pleasure and a privilege uh, to be astronomy as an astronomer in this very exciting uh, time altogether under one sky. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Idina, for this inspiring talk. Not only you gave us a fantastic overview of the science, showcasing also the contribution of early career researchers and people you've mentored, but also reminding us of our societal responsibilities as privileged people that get to do this job in privileged parts of society. So are there any questions? I'm sorry. I... Yes, thank you. <laughs> I think one of the... Oh, oh yes, <laughs> apologies, I love the microphone. Um, yeah, indeed, I think one of the, one of the things that, 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 in fact, you mentioned is that we have a society of responsibilities, and, and personally, this is a personal curiosity, how do you see our collaboration in terms of the big societies going forward in this? Because, of course, the IU has the biggest challenge, right? We encompass countries that are different, from Portugal to Russia, from Norway to Turkey, but of course your challenge is much harder. Yeah. So how do you think we can best help you in this, tackle this challenge? Because this is something that is important to us. Yeah. You know, the Africa <clears throat> session that's been happening every two years in our meetings is something that is really important and um, a priority that we want to keep yeah. developing. Yeah, but exactly, it's... exactly. Well, I think it was actually Kotsoma Kele that said uh, from the beginning that astronomy for development should not be happening only in the developing world, but that there is really a very important role for the more developed world to uh, to interact and to uh, to help to bring back practices, but also vice versa, to learn from <laughs> uh, that. So, and, and uh, I think we have seen that um, since the first the European uh, road and then the North American road. I think in the whole network of roads, um, and I've seen that, I've been at the meetings where all the nodes uh, have come together, uh, and they all tell what they have been doing, but, uh, uh, but also interacting and exchanging information. And, and that's really where sort of the, the European and the North American road uh, can play in a very important role in, in that interaction. So, so I think uh, um, continuing that good work <laughs> is, is incredibly important. Uh, that's uh, lots to do still. Yeah, indeed, no doubt. Thank you. Uh, there is a question. A question here, please. So Bruno Lopez. Uh, so you, you, thank you for your nice talk. You mentioned that the, um, the gas is expected to, well, it is established that the gas is depleted in carbon. Uh, but what about the solid particles, the dust, which is so important to, to initiate the planet formation? Yeah. Uh, is it established that the dust and the 
carbon dust particles are depleted in the inner region of disk. Ah, or? that's a, <laughs> that's the whole. Because, uh, <laughs> because the dust is a, is an important part uh, of the material to form planet. We yeah, cannot yeah. ignore this. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely. I, I did not talk mostly about the gas and the molecules, which are mostly my uh, that. But but there's a very interesting story, of course, about the carbon. The half of the carbon is in is in carbon dust and uh, solid carbon, solid refractory, some, some form of solid refractory carbon. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also well known that the carbon, that the earth is very depleted in carbon. Um, so uh, what seems to be happening is that inside a few astronomical units, uh, those carbon grains are actually eroded, uh, either by reactions with oxygen, basically being burned, uh, or by UV uh, radiation. And that they then being turned into more volatile material and then basically uh, sublimate and, and, and evaporate. And so you lose a lot of the carbon. I mean, the carbon is in, in, in the Earth is depleted by almost three orders of magnitude compared with comets. Um, so it's a very significant effect. So yes, those kind of effects are to being taken into account also in planet formation models. In fact, it's, um, this, this refractory carbon erosion is one of the few ways in which you can actually get a, a carbon-rich uh, planet, so a high C over O ratio in a planet, if you make it in the inner disk, you, you need to invoke something like that, that you uh, erode the, uh, the carbon grains. Any other questions for Vina? If not, we will move forward as we are already a little late on the schedule. So let's thank her again and congratulate her on her prize and her many accomplishments. So our next speaker is the is ESA's Head of Science and Operations, uh, Marcus kisler pratek He will give the ESA report, update on missions and opportunities. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to, uh, to the ESA report. So I will try to uh, summarize in 15 minutes a little bit what the European Space Agency has been about. Um, my name is Markus Kislapatik. I'm the Head of Science and Operations and the Science Directorate of the European Space Agency. Um, we are mostly located in Madrid, so for me it was just an hour train ride to come here. Uh, we are distributed. We also have uh, at Estec and at Isaac. So I saw a lot of young people in the audience, which somebody told me is just me getting old, but um, I, I will still try to actually give you three slides to actually try to place the Science Directorate within ESA, because of course ESA is a huge organization and the science directorate is only a small part of it. So what really we're trying to do is, uh, in the science direct, is to empower Europe to lead space science. So we want to actually make sure that all of you have the best capability to do your science um, when you need actually space capabilities. So that's our goal. Um, but ESA is a lot more than that. It has a lot of establishments. It has eight establishments in Europe uh, that you see here on the map. And it has a spaceport in South, uh, South America. And it has a lot of programs. Um, and all of these programs, I'm going to try to summarize them here, but it's uh, telecommunications, satellite navigation, Earth observations. So, for example, these three um, make up half of the budget of ESA, which is about six billion per year, or six and a half billion. Uh, so you see that this is, uh, has become really the major part of what the space agency does. Science is still the only mandatory program in which all the 22 member states have to contribute, but that was set by the convention 50 years ago when nobody thought that anybody would go to space but freaks. Okay? In the meantime, of course, it's a huge part of our economy. We do a lot of things. Our daily lives are completely dependent on it. You would have never been able to find this place without your phone and, uh, and the satellite navigation and so on. So the um, world is changing quickly. Um, science is still part of it. Um, the other big part of it is, of course, space transportation, developing um, actually launches for all of these satellites, technology in general, operations, which is in Darmstadt. And then finally, finally, um, human ro and robotic exploration. So these are our colleagues which uh, go everywhere where you can land, that is uh, ISS, uh, Moon, and Mars, and then the space science. Uh, space science is what I'm going to report today uh, about, um, and that's where we're serving most uh, of you as a, um, as a population. And we have our headquarters in Madrid, um, here in Spain. So that directorate inside uh, ESA is, uh, is, is looking for a new director, by the way. So if you feel inspired, uh, we'd love to actually welcome you, especially if you're under 50. Um, I think, and uh, by the end of July is, uh, is a deadline. So our yearly budget is about 600 million. Um, just to put that into a context, if you know about the European Southern Observatory, it's about twice their budget. If you know about CERN, it's about half of their budget. Um, the NASA Science Mission Dir Directorate has a budget of 8 billion per year. So you see that we're actually uh, less than 10% of what NASA can spend on science. Uh, but for that, I think we're doing exceptionally well. 
Um, we have about 500 staff, about uh, 250 people employed directly by ESA, 250 employed by, by other contractors. As I said, we are located mostly in the Netherlands at ESTEC and in Spain at ESAC, but we also have staff at STSCI and at the Goddard Space Flight Center. And what um, we are doing is really stewarding on behalf of you the, uh, the money that we get um, to both provide missions in heliophysics, in planetary science, and in astronomy and fundamental physics, which is the part I'm going to focus on um, today. Um, and the way it works is that uh, it's done by you, really. I mean, it's, uh, it's community-based, uh, bottom-up decisions on, on where we want to go, um, and then peer reviews of the proposals of the missions we get, and trying to actually build a program with that, and trying to balance the program between the different disciplines, trying to balance it between very large missions, medium-sized missions, small missions, uh, participations in partner missions. And it happens on a long time scale. Typically, you plan a mission 10 to 20 years ahead, and you run it then for 10 to 30 years, if in the case of Hubble. So you see that actually a mission can actually cover half a century. And um, we have an exercise with the community uh, every 10, 15 years. Um, I'm here showing the one going back to the 80s. Um, and the 80s, that's when uh, we decided about some cornerstone missions like SOHO and XMM Newton, which uh, many of you still use uh, uh, very actively. Uh, Cluster and Integral are also still uh, working. They're in orange here because they reached the end of life. Others' missions have flown and were very successful, like Herschel and Planck, for example. And really, you see that actually what uh, we are doing right now is only implementing what the previous generation has planned for us. And we are preparing something that the next generation can implement. So if you go into the 90s, that's... Um, when we had uh, planned Gaia and Bepi Colombo, of course, Gaia was extremely prominent here. I saw that somebody sneaked in a, a, a sticker um, uh, right there, so um, thanks for the extra publicity. Um, uh, Bepi Colombo, where we flanked to, uh, to, to Mercury, Mars Express. And the main program, so it was in the early 2000s that all of these missions were added, JUICE, Athena, LISA as our large missions, as our flagship missions, uh, M-class missions such as Solar Orbiter. If you have been at the plenary yesterday, you saw the spectacular results there. Euclid, Plateau, Ariane, and Vision are still to come. Cheops is flying now. Uh, Comet Interceptor has just been adopted. And then we have actually prepared last year the Voyage 2050. So essentially actually planning missions which probably only the youngest ones among you will actually still see and, uh, and, and work with, and maybe even the generation after that really is, uh, is going to use. So it's really our, our duty to actually carry the, the torch along and make sure that uh, all of us in Europe have access to, um, to resources which put us, some of our science at the forefront. Then we have other participations on other missions. So we're actually also there to actually help you to actually access missions that otherwise would be impossible for us to do. Hubble, Webb, these are missions which cost 10 billion euros. So these are way beyond actually what we could afford as the European Space Agency, right? Our largest ones like Juice, Athena, Lisa are around 1 billion. So kind of a tenth of what uh, just Hubble or, or Webb would cost. But through actually these agreements with other partners, with other space agencies, we actually give you also the option to actually work on these missions. The nice thing about the European Space Agency is that we are the one agency which works with all the others. Uh, there are other, others have conflicts among themselves, but we have our prime partner, usually um, NASA. We do a lot with them. We also work a lot with JAXA. Uh, the Japanese Space Agency, but also we have missions together with the Chinese Space Agency and with Roscosmos. The, the Roscosmos story is a little bit more complicated one at the moment, but we hope that um, in, uh, in a decade or so we'll, uh, we'll be back on, uh, on good terms. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick overview of, uh, of the missions that we're currently flying uh, in astrophysics, fundamental physics, and, uh, and physics missions. This is just the one graph. You've probably seen that. You can get the postcard of that at our booth. When you see a mission that's in the top row, it means that it's in the study phase and the development phase. So these are the ones we are preparing and which are actually going to be launched maybe in a year or, or say, in the next decade. In the middle row there, you have the missions that are currently operating, Webb, Hubble, Gaia, Cheops, XMM Newton, Integral. And then in the bottom row, you have all the missions for which we actually have the data archived. And through our archives, I hope that you've been at the lunch session today, but just remember sky.esa.int, and that's where you can actually all of these data. They're still curated. We try to actually make them uh, to really an easy interface for you to actually play with these data, interconnect them, and so and, and get the best science out of them. So just for completeness, I showed you that you also have a heliophysics and also planetary missions. So that would be the same overview, but for the heliophysics and planetary missions. Um, so the top row, again, are missions that we are preparing. The middle row are the missions that we are flying. The closest to the sun, there's solar orbiter. But we, of course, also have planetary missions like Pepe Colombo flying to Mercury or two missions currently orbiting Mars, Mars Express and ExoMars. And at the bottom, all the missions that we have in the archive. 
Um, so that's our program. We have uh, typically at a given time a dozen or so missions that we are preparing and about a dozen that we're operating and then they keep accumulating in the archive which is filling and we have uh, close to 30 missions now in the archive. So some highlights of last year, what, uh, what have we achieved, what we have accomplished, or things I want to draw your, your attention to. Um, uh, Solar Orbiter, it's really its first year of, uh, of nominal operations. Um, it passed, it uh, had a pure helium uh, in March. It made this incredible picture of a 9,000 by 9,000 pixels, so you won't be able to display it uh, in full on your uh, on any device probably, unless you have a really large TV at home. Um, you saw a movie of that actually yesterday, and uh, I think from the, the first result we got there, the first scientific results that are just starting to actually appear, um, the solar community will be actually very happy for, for at least a decade, and it's complementing fantastically the, the ground-based uh, facilities that we have in, uh, in heliophysics. Now, in, uh, um, in astrophysics, uh, Hubble is an evergreen. just wanted to remind you that it uh, just celebrated its 32nd anniversary. It's probably good to go for another few years, um, maybe not a decade, because eventually uh, it's like a car that you never serviced. Now that we cannot reach it anymore, some components will just age. Um, it's the record holder of publications. So the, the, the refereed publications based on Hubble are now close to 20,000. But the fantastic thing is that 34% of these are um, of, uh, of European, I mean, with first authors uh, working at a European institution. So this partnership with NASA was really worth it. Uh, our nominal share is actually 15%, but you see that actually you, uh, we, are getting out of it much more than, uh, than we invested. So we'll continue to actually look at, uh, at joining some of the flagship missions of NASA, um, exactly to actually uh, celebrate such successes. We have a, a birthday conference, uh, which we were trying to actually do for the 30th birthday, but that fell th uh, through um, in two weeks in, uh, in Stockholm. So it leads me to, to Webb. Um, so Webb is again one of these flagship NASA missions um, that we, uh, we joined, again with a, a nominal 15% uh, contribution, and we hope that uh, all of us, all of you, um, will actually manage to exploit it as, as much as, uh, as you did for Hubble. Uh, ESA, of course, provided the launcher, so Webb was launched on an Arianes Pass. Um, then you see here in the middle the last uh, uh, kind of picture we took from the launch vehicle onto the back of, uh, of James Webb when it was still completely folded in. Um, and uh, we provided the near-spec instrument, uh, the near instrument, and because there's going to be a talk just in, in half an hour if you stay there um, uh, about uh, dedicated to Webb, I'm just going to uh, not say anything further and let you discover that in a second. And I wanted to say a word about Gaia, but again, there's a plenary 15-minute uh, talk just uh, coming up uh, uh, in, in two talks from now, so I won't say much more about the data release 3, as that's going to be covered uh, by uh, Karmi Hodli. And um, just flag this, that in the last three years, 2019, 2020, 2021, in each of these years, there were more than 1,600 uh, referee publications based on Gaia. Typically, Hubble pub publishes 1,000 publications per year. So Gaia completely outpublished the record holder uh, in terms of publication. Um, and I think that's uh, due to two things, A, because we make the data available uh, right away, and B, because they're so easy to use. So um, a great thank you to all the people working, and there are a couple of hundred actually, across Europe in the uh, Gaia Consortium. If you meet one of them, give them a kiss, um, because I think statistically every one of you must have published one paper based on Gaia data. Uh, I, I certainly did, although I'm not working on Gaia, on Gaia at all. Um, so Gaia was actually a fantastic success. We're trying to learn from that and to actually have other survey missions of that kind. We have Euclid and Plato and so on coming up, uh, try to emulate that as well as, as we can. So what's next? To give you a little bit of, a, um, uh, of what's coming up in the, immediately, um, the next mission which was due to launch is Euclid. Unfortunately, Euclid was due to launch on a Soyuz rocket, and with the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, the, um, Russia actually pulled out all its personnel from the crew space base, and there are no Soyuz rockets actually which will fly um, in the foreseeable time. So we're looking for a new launch vehicle. Uh, which means that the date of launch is quite uncertain. It uh, could be that we find a launch vehicle relatively quickly, and uh, as you know, many companies offer you to actually fly to space these days, so, and uh, we, um, we are open to everything. So we might still be able to launch it next year. Um, our guess is it might be 24, but you know, plus minus one year, it's difficult to actually nail down the, the, the launch date for Euclid now. Uh, the good news, though, is that payload module and service module were actually attached together um, at uh, Thales Alenia Space in Turin in March, so we have actually a complete spacecraft. It's going to be fully characterized by the end of the year, so we're ready to launch it as soon as we find the launcher. Um, the other, um, thanks. 
Um, the um, uh, other uh, coming up missions, I mean, the, the other two flagships, Athena and Lisa, uh, with both uh, launch dates in the 2030s, both of these missions are in the study phase. So study phase is when we're still developing the, the concepts, uh, trying to actually exactly price them, and they're both very close to adoption. Adoption is in our jargon when we actually just freeze the concept and freeze the budget and then actually build it for that price and, and for that concept. Now, the problem is that um, uh, for this, we had, uh, these are our typical L-class missions, which we actually pitch at about two yearly incomes, so about a billion. Um, and as, uh, as we are, uh, astrophysicists, we are ambitious, so both of these concepts actually became a lot more uh, ambitious and, and costly than, um, than we had originally planned. So together, they are at, uh, the current versions are at about 3.4 billion. Um, our member states, uh, the science program committee, which are the ones which actually tell us what they want to see in the program, um, told us to cap them at 2.6 billion, uh, which is still a lot of money, um, in order not to completely unbalance the program. So we have to go through an exercise now with, uh, with Athena and eventually also with Lisa to see whether we can uh, de-scope them meaningfully, uh, maintain their flagship character, um, hopefully maintain them uh, on about the time scale that they were planned for and, uh, and move ahead. But I'm quite confident that we'll find, uh, that we'll you know, uh, eventually get both of them uh, to be very exciting missions and indeed of, uh, of breakthrough character. So um, stay tuned. Um, by the end of this year, we should actually have more news about exactly what, uh, what the timeline will be and, and where we're heading. Um, I uh, wanted to flash up just the exoplanets, but I'm going to talk about that on Thursday. So if you're interested in, uh, specifically in the exoplanet missions, come uh, to the exoplanet session uh, on Thursday afternoon and I'll talk a little bit. But just to actually highlight that we are preparing for, um, for Europe really the, the, the most powerful suite of, um, of exoplanet missions with Cheops, with Plato, with Ariel. Web, if you want to count that as an exoplanet mission, I think uh, our community will be extremely well placed to, to lead that field. So uh, that's very nice to see. And then finally, what's ongoing, we have uh, at the moment a selection process for one fast mission. Um, so these are relatively small sized missions, uh, more agile, more flexible to launch faster. So within a, less than a decade, launched in 2030, 20, 20, 2031 and for a medium class mission. So that's kind of a 500 million class mission. Um, the launch of that uh, M7 would be then around 2037 or so. Um, we are in the second phase, which is a technical evaluation, which is due in, uh, in July, and we will select a few to study them in more detail at the end of November. And as I mentioned before, we have the Voyage 2050 exercise, which defines the three big schemes. Google it, ESA Voyage 2050, you can download the report and you'll see a little bit what's coming your way. So especially if you're under 30, um, that's what you're gonna be able to use in uh, your know, kind of mid to end career. For the people above 30, well, you know, out of interest maybe, uh, and, or help us to actually get the young people on, uh, on the road. And one last slide, just for, again, the, the, young among, uh, the younger ones among you, uh, just a reminder that we have research fellowships at ESA every year. We open them in September, so if you uh, are looking for a postdoctoral position, 100% research, um, uh, and to take either in the Netherlands, in Spain, or in the US, then um, look out in September for this. That's it, thank you very much. Uh, here are the two links that you should remember, cosmos.isa.int, if you actually want to actually access the proposals, especially for the redefinition of Athena, for example. We'll open uh, the, the group again to, and we're interested in younger people to join us and to tell us what to do. And sky.isa.int, that's your portal to actually access all the data um, of all the missions. Thank you. Marcus, for, for reminding us what amazing instrumentation and facilities we have access or we will have access to as a European community. It's really amazing. Um, if, are there questions from the audience? Otherwise, I have one to start with. I don't see anyone, so I'll start with mine. Oh, there's someone up. Oh, yes, sorry. Can, there's someone on the, yep, on the upper level. And while uh, the microphone, a microphone, I, I, will, I will ask a question while the microphone is going. Do you care to comment? a little more generally about the impact of the current uh, geopolitical situation is having on ESA facility. You mentioned quickly uh, the impact on Euclid, but there are other, of course, implications. Um, well, two, two, three. So on the Directive for Science, really the one impacted mission is Euclid because we lost our launcher. In our neighboring directorate, the Human and Robotic Explorations, we were expecting to land a rover on Mars. The rover is ready, actually, um, but the launcher, the, the lander would have been a Russian one, which we decided actually not to pursue. 
Um, and so ExoMars, uh, the rover and surface platform, um, is, is really pending. We're trying to actually rescue it. We're trying to actually see whether we can work with, uh, with the Americans or um, to actually land us on Mars or develop a system on our own, but that's, that will really take a long time. But instead of launching this yet, it was originally planned. It's going to launch, I think, at the earliest in 2028. So these are the two big impacts on, on science. And then there are lots of other smaller impacts. We have a couple of missions in the science uh, program which were done in collaboration with the Cosmos, like Integra, where we actually um, have a share of the PIs. We delayed the tax there. We have um, Russian instruments on Baby Colombo, on, uh, on a Mars mission. Um, these are difficult because, of course, these are people we've collaborated for a long time with. These are people which uh, we develop friendship with, with people who know so that politically they, they do not support necessarily what's happening. Um, uh, we are continuing um, uh, on, on essentially on a uh, a bit of a dumped uh, path at the moment, uh, without cutting old ties, because I think eventually we want to, um, to reconnect, as uh, Evina mentioned, I think very correctly, uh, we need to find a path to peace, and uh, hopefully when, uh, in, in better times, um, we don't want to isolate anybody, but, uh, but reconnect everybody across the world with astronomy. Yeah. So, the qu yeah. question over there? Yeah. Uh, one thing that strikes me is, uh, how much faster NASA can be than ESA? Uh, James Webb, for example? Or? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, yeah, that, that's an easy one. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm thinking of uh, TESS, uh, which uh, unfortunately is taking uh, some of the wind out of the sails of, uh, of Plato. Uh, close to my topics of interest. Mm. Uh, NASA can do uh, a small or medium mission uh, in, say, five years, and uh, you just said that uh, ESA is planning on a fast mission, which is effectively in 10 years, and uh, a medium mission uh, in 15 years, which might be 20 uh, once delays uh, get into the way. Uh, do you see any prospect for doing anything faster than that? Um, so, y yes, we're putting a lot of thinking about this, right? So, and in fact, the, if you look at Earth observations within ESA, um, they have actually the Sentinel the, in the Copernicus program, the, the Sentinel missions, and they are faster. The, the trick there is what we really, really only do and, um, is, is to provide the spacecraft or the platform, as we call it in our jargon. And then the instruments on board are typically done by you and uh, at scientific ins uh, institutions. So if you normalize the platform, if that becomes a serial production, as for the Sentinel missions, um, then it's actually faster. So we could indeed try to actually have a serial production of platforms for the science mission. The problem is that we serve so many different communities. So you, you build a very different platform if you fly uh, to the sun as if you have to actually cruise across the solar system or if you just need to orbit this, the, the Earth with a, with a telescope. Um, and so we, uh, we, we will continue to explore that. Uh, very often also for these fast missions, we ask industry to actually use some heritage. Uh, Comet Interceptor, for example, is built on, uh, I mean, we have different concepts, but they're built on heritage of industry which have uh, built similar missions and try to accelerate uh, um, with that pace. Very often though, the pace is uh, dictated by the payload, so by the scientific in uh, institutions in Europe which build the, the instrumentation. And there, I think also on the ground, it's very far, very difficult to build something faster than five years. So I think from you know, decision to, to launch uh, seven, eight years, as we're doing now, it's going to be hard to actually accelerate that uh, by, by a lot. And, and there we'll always probably have a little bit of a, of a deficiency on, on NASA who can inject more money and uh, sometimes does things faster that way. Yeah. Thank you. We'll move on to next speaker. You can find Marcus at the ESA booth if you have more questions for him, and he'll be happy. He already told me he'll be happy to answer your question later. Um, so our third speaker. Yes, first, let's thank him, of course. Our third speaker for the session is, um, is the SKA Science Director, Robert Brown, who will give the SKA a report. Well, thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. So I'd like to um, give you a little bit of an update on where we are with the Square Kilometre Array Observatory. Um, what we're talking about, for those of you who might be new to the concept, I hope that's not many of you, is um, an observatory um, that's only a singular one, 
but it's uh, built of two telescopes on, on three different sites, uh, the headquarters being at Jodrell Bank in the UK, and then the mid and the low telescopes in South Africa and Australia, uh, covering different frequency ranges, uh, the mid telescope uh, beginning at 350 megahertz going up to 15 and a half gigahertz uh, with the equipment uh, initially put in place, and the low frequency sky being observed uh, with the low facility from Australia going from 50 to 350 megahertz. So if we look um, where they are, um, many of you will know where they are, but uh, what we're all about is really a collaboration across the planet. At the moment, we have um, eight ratified members to the intergovernmental organization, only the second in astronomy after ESO. Um, and we already have 16 uh, in the broader partnership who are striving to achieve um, that full membership uh, status through ratification of the treaty. That's well underway. Um, in most of the countries where that hasn't yet taken place, there's already a, a cooperation agreement in place that allows for them to participate fully in the procurement process uh, for the construction of the facility. So why are we doing this? Well, a lot of questions really rely upon the radio part of the spectrum, either to a large degree, uh, um, exclusively in some cases, but in a broader degree with respect to um, uh, observations in other portions of the spectrum. And this is a little snapshot of what that really looks like. Um, in terms of uh, even studying l life in where it might else occur in our, our galaxy, understanding planet formation when we go from the scale of um, particles to pebbles, spanning that range up to, that goes into the centimeter to decimeter range, um, probed best by a matching frequency. Um, well, I won't go through them all in detail, but rather just touch on a couple of these topics in a little bit more detail, but just illustrate to you on this slide just the clear breadth across the spectrum and uh, going down to those areas uh, such as cosmic dawn and the re epoch of reionization when very few other probes extend into those um, uh, regions of, of time in uh, the early universe. So let's uh, move ahead to how we're structured. We have uh, at the moment 14 science working groups that uh, have wide open membership, so I encourage you if you're not already a member of one of these working groups to just go to our website um, and um, uh, indicate that you're interested. Uh, the banner is representing um, what they do and, and uh, can be found, in fact, on our website for download. Um, they're shown here on this one page that captures that breadth of uh, scientific uh, uh, goals that they have in mind. Um, but what makes this really possible is a major step in performance. Um, that's measured by a couple of different metrics in the, in the slide that you're seeing here. Uh, on the top plot, you see just raw sensitivity in terms of um, collecting area divided by system temperature. Some of the existing facilities are, are shown uh, at the same frequencies here, low far in the Netherlands, the very large array in New Mexico. The Maricat facility in South Africa, which is now operational and that will, will become a part of the square kilometer array hardware uh, in South Africa. And what you see is, in fact, this large uh, jump in that raw sensitivity. Uh, in parts of the spectrum, it's a factor of 10. In other portions of the spectrum, it's only a factor of 2 to 3. But in the lower plot, you see survey speed, where the instantaneous field of view has also been factored into this uh, metric. And there you see, over much of the spectrum, it's that order of magnitude and approaching two orders of magnitude in parts of the spectrum. So a really amazing advance in that fundamental survey speed to image the sky effectively to great depth. And as indicated here, it offers the opportunity for a seamless interface to um, the frequency coverage of ALMA at the top end, um, and indeed uh, goes almost to the uh, ionospheric cutoff at the bottom end, so extremely broad. Um, and of course, um, some of the facilities that are currently in use, uh, Meerkat I already made mention of, ASCAP in, um, in Australia, uh, a Pathfinder facility uh, that's uh, working at gigahertz frequencies in, in Australia. Um, we're already just starting to see what this parameter space is opening up in terms of uh, fantastic survey opportunities. And of course, the next generation very large array, if it were funded in, uh, in uh, the United States, would offer a significant supplement uh, at the higher frequency end of the spectrum 
to what we'll be providing. Now, I won't go through the, the details of the slide here. Uh, you can look at that at, at your leisure. But um, it, it just demonstrates qu more quantitatively um, key performance attributes. What I will take a moment to point out is that the angular resolution, uh, what's indicated in this line of the, the um, slide here, is the range over which that angular resolution uh, applies at the full indicative sensitivity. Now, this is remarkable. Most facilities that you'll find have sort of a matched angular resolution that is good for one thing, but if you need to do something a little bit different, it costs you in terms of your performance. Um, the design of the array configurations for both the low and mid-frequency components of the square kilometer array are such that over this very broad range of angular scales, you achieve uh, a nominal performance. And that really changes what you can do. A wide variety of applications can be addressed very, very effectively. And the other major step forward, actually, is the image fidelity. Today's telescopes, radio telescopes, um, have, have a dirty secret, which it's just called the dirty image. Um, normally, you have very poor uh, instantaneous sampling of visibilities, for, which are Fourier transformed to make an image. And a lot of work goes on with nonlinear methods to make a nice image out of that. But at the expense of fidelity, if someone else makes another image of the same piece of sky, will they get the same answer? Chances are they won't, and it will be because the instantaneous sampling was just not sufficient to constrain what the sky looks like enough. And the contrast in that snapshot image quality uh, is indicated on the right-hand side of the slide, where four snapshots with a very large array in each of the four different configurations are compared with a single one with the mid facility. And you can just see the phenomenal difference in that image quality. So this is a game changer. Now, I'll just spend a slide or two on a couple of um, areas that I thought I'd point out in particular, where we've had recent publications that are just highlighting some of the very exciting things that uh, are anticipated. And uh, we've heard about prebiotic molecules already um, a bit earlier from Avina, but um, some of the key transitions in, in these prebiotic molecules actually occur in this 5 to 15 gigahertz portion of the spectrum that will be making that major push in both sensitivity and angular resolution that should enable, um, we hope, the first detections of some of these, these key molecules, uh, which would really be a game changer in terms of um, establishing how common they are um, in, in many of these, uh, these systems. So another, um, I'd mentioned to you that, that image quality aspect and how some of our Pathfinder facilities were already showing us the first step in that direction. Meerkat is a, a prime example of exactly this. This is a, a beautiful Meerkat um, image of the central portions of our galaxy. And this demonstrates that first factor of 10 in image fidelity over what we have today. Um, and, and you can just see with your eyes just how much more effective this sort of imaging is at capturing detail, capturing new physical processes that weren't apparent um, with, with earlier radio telescope imagery. And, and the SK itself will take you that next factor of 10 beyond what you're seeing in this image in terms of that step in image quality. And um, well, I, I, you are the ones who will be making those discoveries, the people in this room. I'll be long retired, I'm afraid, by, at that point. But um, I'll take heart in the fact that you're uh, carrying the torch. Um, but uh, the other, uh, another example, in fact, of, of what some of our current Pathfinder facilities are showing us is what's happening at the very low brightness sensitivity end of the scale. Uh, this is a, a beautiful result from the LOFAR telescope, um, uh, published a couple of years ago now, showing this magnetic filament uh, between two galaxy clusters. And this is uh, you know, this other piece of parameter space, not very high resolution, but extreme brightness sensitivity at low radio frequencies that shows you new things. And indeed, it's, it's this um, cosmic web of magnetic filaments that extends probably between individual galaxies and with of course, uh, at, at much at, at greater brightnesses uh, between clusters of galaxies. But um, this is another area where I, I think uh, a lot will be learned as we get into this realm of, of extreme sensitivity in all of its forms. Uh, the other one, uh, and, and one that was a, a strong motivator, in fact, for the whole concept initially, was using the neutral hydrogen. Um, what you're seeing here on, on, in the left-hand portion 
of each pair of, of images is today's limitations, what we can do with today's sensitivity. Um, and you, you see the beautiful um, spiral galaxies face on and edge on and some extensions in, in the edge on version that go away from that plane. But we're so limited by sensitivity, we can't see what's happening around them. And by doing that, by going the next couple of uh, orders of magnitude in surface brightness sensitivity, the sky does, well, we hope, open up. What you're seeing here are simulations that um, give us that hope that, in fact, we may see much, much more about how galaxies continue to evolve, um, even at low redshifts, um, if you can observe their environments with extreme resolution that allows you to see how that fueling is still occurring, um, admittedly at a lower rate than it did at Redshift 1 when this was going in its heyday. But this is accessible if we have the, uh, the sensitivity to witness it in, in action, and that's what we'll, uh, we'll finally have. Uh, again, showing, highlighting what uh, our Pathfinder facilities are doing, in this case the um, Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder in, in Australia. So the beautiful imagery of the nearby universe in neutral hydrogen. This is a, a, the small Magellanic Cloud. So in, in fact, the large Magellanic Cloud, Magellanic Cloud is off to one side and is much larger yet, but it shows you the exquisite detail and starts to probe that, uh, that low column density regime where we can see both um, the galaxies in, in glorious detail, but also their environments. But it's just a taste of, of what's to come. So where are we now? Uh, well, about one year ago, on the 1st of July, we were given the go-ahead to begin construction by the Square Kilometre Array Council. At this point, uh, procurement is, is really well underway. Uh, you can see the, the timeline and key milestones for both the low and the mid components of, of the observatory um, in the little table here. Um, what's been highlighted is, is when we'll have the first real hardware in the field, mini arrays of, of just a couple of dishes and a couple of stations in the case of low in the field in, um, in early 2024. Um, that's still on, on track to be happening. Um, and, in, and at this point, we have 39 of the major contracts uh, committed, total aggregate value of 150 million euros. Um, and as I say, we're still aligned uh, with the procurement schedule. Everything is still moving on track, so far so good. We expect within the rest of this year to have committed um, up to 400 million. And so that is all progressing uh, very nicely. And you can see what that will lead to um, uh, if we continue apace um, in the, the, um, these various stages of, of, of greater numbers of dishes and, um, uh, and, and stations for both low and mid facilities. And it's about when we reach that AA3 phase um, that's sort of in the middle of, of the, the uh, plot here where, you, where we get to the point of having exceeded the, the current uh, performance by, by a major degree over, over what's in place now. Um, one quick slide on construction risk management. Um, th these are strange economic times, as I, I imagine you can appreciate. Uh, and there are already issues emerging that, that could be quite challenging over the coming months. We've already reacted uh, uh, in a proactive fashion as much as possible to order early for, for long lead time items and those that um, are already known to be scarce. And in fact, we're working very closely with industry to minimize unnecessary risk premiums, uh, which we are encountering in some of the bidding process um, that uh, were being added to quotes. So far, that, that seems to be working quite well. And as I say, we're, we're still within this, um, uh, the probability weighted risk exposure, as it's termed in, uh, um, in, in this, the parlance, is, is still, um, adequate to deliver a 80% success probability of the project with the remaining contingency. So that's good news. Just a couple of quick slides showing you uh, recent construction and prototype progress. Um, the, we have improved the dish stiffness and pointing after having uh, discovered some issues with the prototype. You, you see some of the feed and digitizer prototypes. Now many of the dish foundations in South Africa, the first 20 or so are in fact poured and in place, so that's pro progressing well. Uh, and on the low side, we're uh, making good progress with the prototype in terms of demonstrating very accurate uh, calibration of the uh, station beams, including full stokes uh, calibration of the individual station beams. 
and have uh, done a few final design improvements uh, for the equipment um, before going to order the uh, full amounts. And power, um, power is important. We will be using something like 13 megawatts uh, continuously. Uh, and what we are awarding is contracts worth hundreds of millions of euros so to supply that. And in fact, if you look at what our observatory is predicted to uh, cost in terms of CO2, it's 98% power is where that's coming from. And so what we're committed to is a very high renewables fraction, and this is not simply relying upon suppliers to provide it, but in fact, in making it part of the design, and in fact, to a large degree, um, either building it ourselves or specifying that that is what we require for the providers to do for us. Um, and you can see some of the, the details of that there. I won't go through them um, in the sake of time. But um, yeah, we are aware of, of that uh, need in, in this, uh, these changing times and acting on it. Uh, finally, just showing you um, some um, numbers around the um, um, staffing. Uh, we're, we're currently at about 15 and 15 in both of the uh, um, telescope sites out of a total of 140 that will be there and about very near the full complement at our headquarters of about 140 of the total of 170. And the, um, the Science Operations Center in Perth, you can see Interim uh, Engineering Operations Center and Interim SOC in Cape Town. So things are progressing uh, very well on all fronts. And in summary, we're now an operational intergovernmental organization, only the second, as I said, in astronomy. And we're well on our way to building the two best and largest radio telescopes on the planet. And we hope to enable you to uncover a, an amazing range of science and uh, we're well, well underway to the procurement uh, of that activity. So thanks very much. Thanks a lot for this. Well, wonderful talk and it really, the, congratulations first of all on the advancement of the facility and we're really excited to see, I'm personally very excited to see how, when it's gonna you know, start operating because I believe you have convinced us that it's gonna really open up new fields. Um, if there are questions, please raise your hand. Meanwhile, I'll ask a little bit of a general question. So you have shown what are the possibilities that SKO will open up for astronomy, but we've been made aware, and there was in fact a plenary talk yesterday about it, one of the big threats to this field is the proliferation of satellite constellations. And I know you're working with the IAU on this, and I would like if you could give a little bit of a comment, because we mostly heard on the optical side yesterday, so perhaps you can give a little bit of a comment on this. Yes, I'd be happy to do so, yes. We are, of course, very aware, and we co-host an IAU-sponsored center for protection of the dark and quiet skies. So, and the radio part of that is what we, of course, look after in conjunction with our optical near-infrared colleagues. So we're part of that, and we've already, in the past couple of years, been working with industry to try to engage with them because they are here, it's a commercial enterprise, we, we're not gonna wipe them off the planet or, or off orbit of the planet, unfortunately. Um, but there has been openness and I, I think by having this united voice, we're in a stronger position. And what's been in discussion with them is simply avoiding their direction of their radio power near our telescope sites. And we've already, together with their engineers, established what it would take and the technology is there for their um, beaming of the signals they're generating to do that avoidance to a degree that it would leave us um, in, not in trouble. Uh, and able, with a little bit of um, work on our own part, to deal quite comfortably to coexist. So there are solutions that we're working together with, with industry to, to make happen. And as I say, it's a very good development that we have this support, that, that we're doing it in a joint fashion and can speak with one voice. And, I, and that gives us hope that we'll be successful. Yeah, and I really want to thank you, thank personally SKO for investing so much resources on this because essentially you're, work, you're doing this for yourself, of course, but also for the community. And so a big thank, thank you for this effort. Okay. We've reached the end of the... Oh, there is a... Oh, sorry, I didn't... Hi. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It's a really exciting time to be a radio astronomer. Um, I was wondering, I'm a Meerkat user, and 
as I was wondering, because it's already, it's a precursor, but it's already delivering, delivering such huge data sizes and you need new tools to be able to reduce the data and analyze it. Is SKAO planning on offering training for observers? Yes, and, and in fact, we're going a, a step beyond that, really. Um, unlike any existing observatory, I, I, yeah, I think that's true. We are, in fact, providing, um, have committed to provide fully science-ready data products. So we have quite a significant budget to allow for high-performance computing and are already in the process of developing the calibration and imaging pipelines that would allow for the delivery of things that you're ready to do science with. Together with an environment where you can undertake um, you know, extracting science from those data products. That is a, a related but um, separately funded activity, the, what are called the SKO Regional Center Network, that will provide that interface to the user community where that additional processing will be housed to allow for that science extraction. But we will be providing the science-ready data products, including ones that um, require things like piecing together. So um, observing you know, 20,000 square degrees and, and putting that into a suitable data product for you to analyze. That's part of what we deliver. So yes, we will be training, but we'll also actually, unlike I think anyone today, I think, uh, be providing you with, with something that ought to be ready to go with, without a lot of um, expert knowledge and, and, and enormous computing resources to, um, needed to do so. This is quite amazing, really. Okay, let's thank again Robert for his presentation. And we're going to have a change of chair now. My fellow council member in Madubingas will be the chair for the second part of this plenary. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me introduce our next speaker with Karma Jordi from the University of Barcelona, and her talk is about the richness of Gaia database free. Karma. Okay, uh, good. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, to the organizers for um, selecting Gaia as one of the topics for these plenary sessions and uh, also for inviting me to represent the Gaia community to show the uh, Gaia the Earth 3 as, uh, as has been said uh, today. Um, this is one of the achievements of the ESA science uh, this year. So let me uh, remind a little bit, Gaia is a satellite with two telescopes. It is continuously scanning the sky. And in this scan, you uh, are covering different stars. Uh, this is an animation of one second, a, a real detection of stars in one second. And we have, uh, yeah, in, an average of about 70 uh, million transits per day, 70 million observations of stars, of objects per day. And uh, since the launch, um, and the scientific operations started in July uh, 2014, we have already collected, or we have been working almost uh, 3,000 3, days uh, with two, more, two million, a bit more than two trillion uh, individual observations. So, which is, uh, yeah, a huge, a huge amount, uh, amount of data. Let me uh, remind as well uh, the uh, three main instruments of Gaia. On board Gaia, we have uh, the astrometry, where we determine the uh, positions uh, on the sky and then um, looking at the same star uh, rep repeatedly in different, in, different, uh, in different times, we can see how the position changes and this allows to determine, to derive um, proper motions and also uh, parallaxes. Then we have the, the photometry. The photometry is intended to uh, determine if the stars of the objects uh, change the brightness or it's constant, uh, also the colors, and also to determine um, by um, 
dispersed in the light in low resolution uh, spectroscopy. Uh, we have uh, the determination of the parameters so we can classify uh, galaxies and quasars and solar system objects and we can uh, determine um, astrophysical parameters like temperatures, uh, masses, um, um, ages, and, and so on and so on, and the dust in between and so on. And finally, we have the spectroscopy. The spectroscopy, of course, have a higher resolution than, than the spectrophotometry, and uh, of course, have a brighter uh, limiting magnitude because of the higher resolution. And uh, this information allows us to determine the third company of the velocity, that means the radial velocities, and uh, also the uh, strength of the lines uh, in the spectra that uh, allows us to determine not only temperatures and gravities, but also the chemical and the chemical composition. So uh, this is the um, uh, this is what um, makes uh, the whole uh, DR3 uh, Gaia, the Eta release uh, uh, three of Gaia, so wonderful. Actually, we we had um, if you see the cursor, yeah, here, yeah. So in this, in this uh, low bullet here, we have uh, the astrometry and the photometry for one and a half billion sources. This was already uh, in the year three, the year one, the year two, and, and early the year three. This is something that you, uh, most of you know and you have been using already. Uh, and, and now uh, we have complemented all, all, all this data, all this information that has been wonderful and has produced uh, more than, uh, I'm sorry, uh, more than, uh, more than uh, uh, almost uh, 1,600 papers per, per year already, as, as Marcus mentioned before. Um, we have um, uh, complemented this wonderful information with uh, more wonderful information about um, the chemistry, about the radial velocities, about the classification of the objects in such uh, amount of data and precision that it is unprecedented uh, till now. No? So we have uh, binaries, uh, binaries, we have um, asteroids, we have radial velocities, we have classification of the objects, variables, low resolution spectroscopy, um, extragalactic objects, and high resolution spectroscopy. So in the next slide, I will try to summarize a little bit all this, uh, but of course I cannot go deep because uh, we don't have time. Every topic uh, merits uh, four or five uh, talks. And, and so I, I, I only provide an, an overview. Um, one of the treasures is the spectroscopy. Uh, till now we had only uh, seven, uh, seven million radar velocities and we have now 33 million, which changes completely, uh, completely the, the, the scene uh, for, for working on the structure and, and, and kinematics of, of the galaxy. But also we have uh, three million of um, rotational velocities and we have published one million of those spectra. So you can work directly with the spectra if, if you want. In, in this plot, you have uh, basically in this map, a map of the radial velocities of the, this, this third component of, of the velocity, and the different, the different colors uh, correspond to different velocities, and the darker are the um, areas of the galaxy that uh, look like the stars are, are approaching us, and the bright ones, the, the ones that are receding, receding us. And this pattern here of uh, uh, dark, uh, bright, dark, uh, and... and Bright uh, is actually a, a reflex of the of the motion of the rotation of the stars um, uh, around the, the center of, of our galaxy. It's mainly the disk stars. Um, this data has been used as well for, for uh, the uh, structure of the galaxy, uh, at least in the solar neighborhood. Here we have the the um, spiral arms. Uh, uh, um, targeted by the, by the OB type stars and for young clusters. And in, in the right, you have uh, the Cephate. So you, you see, you, you can outline the, the uh, spiral arms. And, and also in the, in the bottom part, you see the three components of the velocity, BR, B, uh, B, um, B phi and B and B zeta, and, and you can see that actually where we have the upper densities of the, of, of the spiral arms, uh, we have, uh, um, um, 
component of the velocity which is different than in the interarm. So we have different behavior, different velocities in the arms than in the interarm, something that uh, we, we, you, you can exploit uh, in, in, in the future. Um, related with the spectroscopy, on the top you, you see uh, uh, um, a spectra, a, a composition of several spectra with different uh, temperatures and different chemical compositions, a, a plot that you have seen in several talks uh, today and yesterday. And uh, on, on the bottom part, you see, you see the map, the map of these uh, chemical um, abundances determination in terms of, of metallicity. Different colors means different, uh, different abundances. The red uh, part uh, here concentrated on the disc are the most metal rich stars, and then in the anti-center and spread over around you have the, the less metal poor stars. Uh, of course, this map is different uh, if you make slices in distances, as Alejandra has shown in, in, in his plots uh, this, uh, this morning or oh, yesterday, I, sorry, I don't remember exactly. Um, and um, this is uh, based on, on two and a half million chemical abundances determinations for stars brightened than about 13.6. And, and here in, on the right part, uh, you, you see the trends, the trends with galacti galactocentric um, distances uh, of the chemical compositions uh, in general and the alpha elements. So here we have a clear trend, here is something a bit more, more flat on, on the determination. Uh, now move to the spectros uh, spectrophotometry, which is this low resolution uh, sp spectroscopy. And uh, we have uh, two prisms, one in the blue and one in the red, covering from 330 uh, um, uh, to 680 nanometers, and then from 640 to 1,000 nanometers, more or less. And then uh, we have uh, this uh, spectra that you have in the top, uh, top right. If you collapse them uh, to one dimension, you have these uh, structures, uh, the, these shapes uh, on, the bottom, on the bottom part. Left is for BP and right is for RP. And the different shapes correspond to different, <coughs> to different uh, kinds of stars uh, that are colored here according to the uh, color index. Uh, this is related with the, with the temperature. Um, here we have the signal to noise ratio, but actually, uh, since it is related with the uh, flux that we receive, it's also related with the, with, the, with the flux, so the shape is more or less the same. And we can see that the red uh, source have a low flux in, in blue and a high flux in, in red, and the other way around, a blue star have a, a lower flux in, in an RP and a much uh, higher flux in, in BP. So these uh, shapes, uh, sorry, these shapes uh, allows us to, to uh, look at uh, all the stars across the HR diagram uh, here, and you have a movie on how this spectra on the left, here on the left, this spectra here we have blue, cut it, and then linked uh, with, uh, with RP, how these uh, shapes change uh, when we are in different positions in the HR diagram, and on the Right, you have the same spectra calibrated externally. In the, in the left part, we have the internal calibrated spectra, and in the right part, the absolute calibrated spectra. And of course, different stars in different positions in the edge of the diagram uh, look different. And, um, and uh, for the first time, we have such kind of detailed information for all ages, uh, stages of the evolution of the, of the stars, uh, not only mean sequence, but also evolved the stars and also in the, in the branch of the uh, white dwarfs. This uh, has allowed to, um, to apply uh, uh, several algorithms for the determination of astrophysical parameters. And um, uh, first of all, um, all the sources have been classified into stars and uh, quasars or galaxies, uh, solar system and so, so we have a first classification. And then depending on the classification of the object, it has been treated as a star or uh, or galaxy and, and different parameters have been determined. Based on, on the spectra, more than, well, almost a half a billion uh, stars have been uh, treated to determine uh, temperatures and gravities and metallicities, absorptions, and, and not only in one using one method, but using several methods, as you can see on the, on the left part in, in, in the 
plot on the left part, and here you, you see that different models uh, have been uh, treating different uh, types of stars, and then in some cases, one type of star has been um, treated by several algorithms, so it means that you have a variety of determinations of, temp of parameters of temperatures and gravities, and depending on the, on the science that you want to do, you, you may choose or you may rely more on one, uh, one set of, uh, of parameters or another set of parameters. There is also, for the brightest uh, sources here, uh, about uh, um, um, 14 magnitude, uh, the classification uh, is also provided from the uh, high-resolution spectroscopy. So this is for uh, more than um, 5, million, 5 million sources. And so you, you have both sets uh, from spectrophotometry and from the, from the spectra. Um, then... Um, I was talking before that uh, we, uh, we observe the stars uh, several times, and um, this means that we can uh, monitor the stability, the constancy of the, of the brightness, and we detect variability, of course. And um, the novelty in these uh, data releases is that uh, we have uh, gone from uh, half a million uh, sources in the year two to uh, 10 million sources uh, in, in, in the year three. And these 10 million sources have been classified uh, in 24 types of variability. So in the year two, we had less sources and less types of variabilities, and now we have been able to deal with more than with, with 10 million and, and, 20, and 24 types. And here you have, uh, so we have uh, Cephades, we have Aurora Lyra, we have um, eclipsing binaries, we have long period variables, uh, also we have planetary transits because the, 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 tra the the occultation or the, yeah, the eclipsing of, of, the, of the planet uh, when it, it is in front of, of the stars. We have micro-lensing events that uh, Lucas was, was talking today. And um, um, just uh, one example here you have on the, on, the, on the right, you have the light curves of, um, of a Cephate. You have the G band, the BP, and the red P, and the RP band in, in red, blue, and red. And then in the uh, bottom part, you have the a radial velocity curve because you, we are able to, to, to see how the star oscillates and how the star pulsates. No? So we, we have uh, not only the light curves, but also for about 2,000 uh, sources, we have also the radial velocity, radial velocity curves. Um, and on this stellar variability, uh, Lohan was, uh, Lohan Ayer was uh, telling us about uh, this uh, wonderful um, set of uh, Delta Scuti stars and uh, that we have today uh, the best and extended uh, relation, period, period um, uh, West and height uh, relation uh, for this Delta Scuti star covering a, a large uh, um, range of periods. And how this uh, large range of periods uh, and, and this relation Relationship um, leagues, and it is looks like it is continuous with the with the classical uh, surface, in, and you can see in the uh, right in the left uh, bottom uh, plot. But also, uh, we we have been. Um, discovering that we do not have only this kind of uh, variability in, in, in the uh, instability strips in beta speed or delta scuti, but also we have this kind of two clumps here of stars with, uh, uh, well, which, which variability is, uh, sorry, which variability is um, not uh, yeah, explain it still by the by the stellar models, and this is something that uh, yeah we have to you have to pursue in the in the in the future. Um, uh, all the, the light that comes from, from the stars have to go through the interstellar medium till uh, it arrives to, uh, to the telescope, to, to, to Gaia, and uh, of course it suffers uh, reddening and it suffers absorption uh, by, by the, this uh, interstellar medium. And uh, this is one example of uh, the maps that we have been able to build uh, from these uh, astrophysical parameters that we have determined. And on the top you have uh, the extinction map um, basically produced uh, because of the dust uh, on the interstellar medium. And uh, on the bottom, you, you see this, uh, the integrated um, 
the total, the total galactic extinctions are integrated till uh, long, uh, large distances, and this has been computed uh, based on, on giants, which are very bright, and we can see at, at, at long distances, and of course, avoiding the, the galactic plane. So we have the extinction maps, and, and we have the total uh, galactic extinction map on, on the bottom. And we have also uh, been able with, uh, with the almost uh, half a million um, uh, spectra in, in RVS, in the uh, high resolution spectroscopy, high in terms of Gaia, of course. Uh, so um, uh, we have uh, detected the diffuse interstellar band at 862 nanometers. And these uh, have been able to, well, uh, computing the, the equivalent width of the, of the line, we have this map. This map, the color of the map depends on the, is based on, on the equivalent uh, width of the, of the interstellar band in each of the pixels uh, of the direction of the sky. And, and then you see then the distribution, and the distribution doesn't match exactly the same distribution that the, that the dust, means that the, probably it's caused that the, the, these uh, um, deep uh, carriers do not have the same distribution than the dust. And actually here in the, in the left, you see the correlation with extinction, but and also in the right, you see the correlation of how these um, uh, dips uh, move, uh, so this is the radial velocity compute, the, the uh, galactic velocity computed using the radial velocity of these, uh, of these dips, and uh, superposed with the kinematics of the clouds of, um, of CO, and then you see that there is a correlation that, well, um, may mean that actually um, the uh, carriers of these uh, dips are related with the gas and not with the, with the dust. Um, another um, uh, box that we open with uh, DR3 is the uh, case of the multiple uh, stars. Uh, we know that many of the stars are variable, perhaps 50% uh, or more. And, um, and in our case, we have been studying these non-single stars from the point of view of the three instruments, so the astrometry, the photometry, and the spectroscopy. And uh, we have uh, published um, um, about uh, eight, um, 800,000 uh, binaries with orbits and, and so on, the different detections, uh, different methodology and so Among them, of course, there are exoplanets. Uh, some of them are new, uh, more than 100 are new candidates for exoplanets. And uh, here on, on the, on the on the plot, you, you have basically eccentricity um, as a function of the period and uh, the magnitude as a function of the period. And, and, and we see that different kinds of, um, uh, of binaries are detected in different regimes, of course, the eclipsing binaries. Uh, have uh, short periods. The spectroscopic binaries um, tend to be bright because of the limiting magnitude of, of, uh, of the spectroscopy in Gaia. The astrometric um, detections uh, have long periods, of course. And here, then, we have, uh, as a function of the eccentricity, as well, the well, the eclipsing binaries tend to be circularized, and so the, the eccentricity is low, while the others are not uh, such, such the case. One example uh, of these orbits of, um, of non-single stars uh, that we also have been uh, discussing this, uh, this morning is this case for, that we see one star that, uh, well, we, we can see the orbit in, from the astrometric point of view. We can see also variation of the radial velocity, so we have the radial velocity uh, curve. And in this case, the determination of the masses uh, points towards uh, a compact uh, companion this is what uh, it's called uh, the dormant companion. So it's about 6,000 um, of these, uh, of these um, pairs with one star in the mean sequence and another one that is probably a white dwarf or a black hole or a, or a, a neutron star that have not yet undergone the mass transfer and not yet the um, X-ray X -ray emission. Um, this is um, an example of um, this is an example of uh, of these uh, binaries. This is only 300 of them. Um, the color corresponds to the temperature, the color of the primary, and then you see here a variety of eccentricities, orientations, uh, semi-major axes, and so and so and so. Um, um, 
Gaia observes everything that crosses the focal plane and uh, has an appearance of a uh, point like so. Uh, then, uh, in some cases, we do not detect uh, stars, but we detect uh, asteroids or minor bodies in the solar system, actually. Um, and this is the case uh, that uh, now we release um, 100. Uh, 56,000 uh, orbits of asteroids. On the left uh, part, you, you see the um, uh, orbits, and they are color-coded according to the distance to uh, well, perihelion distance. So the blue part are the, the, the bluest ones, are the ones that are smallest, uh, have the smallest uh, distance, and the red ones are the ones that have um, uh, uh, larger distances. And on the right, you see, well, we have changed a little bit the columns, and every, every uh, asteroid has been um, uh, drawn with a small line that corresponds to the uh, motion of 10 days. And one can see that in the interior, in the interior, the, the lines are, large, are longer and they are shorter in the um, at further distances. And it is because, of course, uh, close to the, to, to the sun, we have uh, larger uh, velocities than in the case of uh, the Trojans, for instance, or the main, uh, the main belt. Um, Together with uh, the orbits of the solar system objects, we have also the um, uh, spectra. The, the spectra. So, if we normalize the spectra by the solar uh, for the solar spectrum, we can see the reflectance spectra, and we have published. 60,000 of those, and uh, this allows us to classify the stars, uh, sorry, the stars, the, the asteroids according to their compositions, if they are carbonous, carbonosus or silicates or, or and so on. And for the first time, we have on the bottom, uh, on the bottom plots, not only the families of the, of the asteroids according to their um, semi-major axis, inclinations and eccentricities, but also because uh, according to their composition. So for the first time, we can relate the families with the compositions, and this will provide clues about the uh, formation of those uh, asteroids. Again, we do not upset only um, yeah, stars or solar system objects, but also uh, far distance galaxies or quasars may have an up a look like uh, a point like um, uh, appearance in the in the in the focal plane and we also observe them we have uh, 2 million of quasars and three about 3 million of galaxies for which we have uh, detect determined um, uh, morphological uh, parameters like uh, the ellipticity the uh, uh, the position angle and also the effective radius, and here you have uh, the comparison with the external catalogs, with the SDSS um, um, uh, catalog, and there is a quite good correlation. Of course, this is uh, tend to be objects that are fainter than, um, than majority, well, than, than many of the stars, but uh, yeah, this is what we also uh, expect. We um, have here a composition of the spectra of the quasars because, um, yeah, we observe quasars at different redshifts and when uh, we correct for the redshift and then uh, we have the uh, spectrum at the white black of rest, we can compose all of them in, in only one spectra and this is the uh, um, solid uh, black line on, on the bottom, and it is compared with ground, uh, with other observations, which is the orange orange line. Uh, this is, well, not new, but uh, as, as Anthony also said uh, yesterday, so it's uh, actually that something that uh, we, at the beginning, we an didn't anticipate that Gaia could, uh, could produce. Um, probably you want that I finish with some uh, future perspectives, and actually I have to say that uh, the uh, consortium, uh, the uh, Data Processing Analysis Consortium, composed by about uh, 40, uh, 450 um, 50 people around Europe and, and, and some colleagues uh, around the world, um, have uh, been working very hard to produce this uh, DR3 uh, release. But also, I have to say that some uh, groups in, in this team uh, have been starting to already produce the fourth uh, data release. And more than a year ago, we started to ready the um, computations and the treatment of the five years of observations to produce the year four. So it's time, and it's, it's, it's longer to produce a mission, but it's also, for us, longer to produce a release. And, and then, uh, yeah, it takes some, some years. And if we want to, to publish the next release uh, 
by 2025 to be confirmed. Uh, so we have to start with, uh, years in advance. Um, in terms of operations, um, we uh, will be run out of fuel uh, by 2025 as well. And, um, well, we are uh, now approved for extension till that date, uh, but it's a provisional approval, and we hope uh, to have, at the end of this year, the confirmed uh, approval for the extension and uh, possible operations of Gaia till uh, the next of the fuel, which could mean 10, 10 years of, um, of, of data. And I want to um, finish with uh, giving a big thanks to all the people that has been uh, made a huge contribution uh, to this uh, production of Data Release 3, uh, the members of the Data Processing Analysis Consortium, and also to all of you that we hope you will be, well, we know that you, uh, some of you are already using the data. And uh, actually, as I said, it's hard for us to work on that, but uh, it's also, um, yeah, it's quite, we are quite proud that you use the data and to see that uh, it is, um, well, um, sent a mission which has such scientific production at the level of the world and the level of visa. This uh, allows us to, this motivates us to continue working and produce the next, uh, the next releases. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Karma, and um, now it's time for questions. I think we have been work talking about Gaia some <laughs> during yesterday and today, so probably there are no questions. The no? Any comment questions? Yeah. Okay. The question is not on Gaia, but just to reassure our colleagues from ESA that even not so young people can have ideas for the future. The question is, what comes after Gaia? What are the plans for the next mission? You know, 2030, year five, the community has to think to the next step. Yeah, actually in this um, program Voyage 2050 that Marcus was talking about before, um, one of the teams um, for the large mission is still dual. So it's uh, exoplanets and in case that exoplanets may fail, then uh, the alternative is the um, observation of the galaxy astrometry in the near infrared. Actually, some of us, and uh, David Hobbs probably is around here, uh, he has made a talk uh, um, half an hour before about this continuation, and we call Gaia near, well, provisionally Gaia near. The idea is to, yeah, to, to repeat Gaia, but uh, um, allowing capabilities in the infrared, um, this would allow us to go through the uh, obscured regions of the galaxy that we cannot see with, with Gaia. The idea is to yeah, take advantage of the knowledge and the expertise that we have collected with the Parcos and Gaia, and then uh, yeah, transmit that to the next generations uh, to be able to produce another uh, successful mission in the future. Mm -hmm. So thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot. Okay, so we go to our last talk of this session. And let me introduce Roberto Maiolino from the University of Cambridge, speaking about the James Webb Space Telescope, a new, our new window into the universe. Hello, everyone. Uh, and I should say that I'm actually replacing Luis Colina, who uh, couldn't come, unfortunately. And I also apologize that uh, because of the short notice, the slides are not as polished as uh, I would have liked. So uh, this is uh, an outline. I will touch on a little bit of the history behind the web uh, with emphasis on the European uh, involvement. 
um, I will give an overview of the observing modes, uh, where we are in, in commissioning, and what is expected uh, about the science uh, in, in cycle one and uh, subsequently. So, uh, web, I think this is the first embryo of web, web which was essentially at the workshop, this workshop in uh, 1989, at uh, that time about uh, the next generation space telescope and uh, at that time actually uh, the Hubble Space Telescope had not been launched yet. But uh, uh, it uh, had to wait until 96 uh, when uh, the Dressel Committee uh, essentially uh, recommended NASA to uh, develop a new mission uh, with a four meter uh, size telescope uh, uh, focused uh, mostly in the, um, in the near infrared, in the, sorry, in the infrared generally. And uh, uh, a key point, a key moment was uh, at the uh, WS meeting in 96 uh, when the, uh, Dan Golding, the NASA administrator, uh, addressed the uh, audience saying that uh, you ask NASA for a four meter uh, infrared telescope, but uh, why do you ask for such a modest thing? Why not go for a six or seven meter? Um, I'm used to agencies uh, downscoping all our projects and uh, uh, dreams and so on. So I think this is the first time I've heard that uh, the agency actually is telling off scientists for not being ambitious enough. So I just thought that I would drop the, there in case uh, our European agencies uh, want to follow the lead. Uh, uh, however, <laughs> and anyway, I think this is the key moment when web started to take the form that we know it uh, as it is uh, nowadays. Now, various years of uh, design transform web in closer and closer in what we know it, uh, it is now. And uh, a key moment also was also in 99, especially for Europe, because is at that point, together with the Canadian Space Agency, joined the, the, the project and was, uh, I think, a fantastic idea, I would say. And uh, uh, then construction started in uh, 2004. And another key moment for, again, ESA was in 2005 when NASA agreed to use Ariane 5 as a launcher. This, I think, is the first time that NASA used, decided to use a, a, is an ESA um, launcher for one of his, uh, actually for his flagship uh, um, mission at that time. Well, currently still. Um, then uh, mirrors were completed in 2011. And uh, in 2012, uh, uh, there was, uh, the, the first instrument was delivered and it was MIRI. And uh, again, a great proud for Europe because, it's, uh, as you know, it is uh, uh, half developed by uh, European consortium. And uh, so um, kudos uh, to the uh, MIRI consortium for actually being the first actually to, the, to deliver the, uh, the, instrument, the first instrument to, to NASA. And then the optical telescope was completed in 2016. And after several years of testing and so on, it was launched in 2021. And the, the, the launch was perfect, uh, and uh, this actually uh, is enabling uh, the mission to last much longer than we expected, because as you may know, the, um, the trust given by RM5 had to be under barnet because it would have not been possible to correct uh, a, a, an overthrust. And so the idea was to under barn and then go to L2 with uh, using the uh, propellant on, on web. But the, the thrust given by Ariane 5 was so accurate, super solid, that it actually get nearly to L2 without with needing uh, only a little bit of additional uh, thrust from the, using the propellant on board of, of web. And uh, uh, this, of course, uh, since the mission is limited by the propellant to keep uh, the telescope in orbit and for you know, dumping uh, momentum and other things, this is, implies that the mission has been extended probably, hopefully, beyond uh, its uh, goal lifetime, which was 10 years. So uh, this is thanks to ESA and everyone, praised by, by everyone for this uh, perfect launch. And uh, I've been at that time in several telecoms with NASA, and everyone was impressed how rocket science, uh, meaning the science of rockets, <laughs> is now so accurate that you can actually uh, explode a bomb to put a satellite just in the right position. L2. It's, it's really impressive. 
Um, so it's uh, taken several years uh, of development and testing, uh, and of course there's been delays, uh, and it's easy to blame about these delays, but let's face it, uh, this is one of the most ambitious projects in the history of astronomy and science. So it's not uh, unexpected that there's been difficulties, unexpected problems on the way. Um, as mentioned, uh, Europe has played a key role in the in, uh, in web, uh, the line, Arian 5, uh, two of the instruments, uh, and to me are the, the most complex, I think they are the most complex instrument in, uh, on board of the Space Telescope, sorry, of the uh, Web Telescope, and also is providing uh, staff for the operations and uh, in the archive. Um, but uh, uh, beyond Europe, is, uh, uh, Web is a great international uh, project uh, involving nearly 260 companies, agencies, uh, and universities, and uh, uh, about 100, more than 100 uh, of them in 12 European nations. So it's really a global uh, enterprise. These are the instruments on Web. So MIRI is the mid infrared instrument that, uh, as I mentioned, is developed, is, has been developed by partnership 50-50 between an European consortium and institutes in the, uh, in the US. NIRSPEC is the other instrument provided by ESA. It's a fantastic instrument. I'm a bit biased because I'm in the NIRSPEC team, of course. And uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, the, the first multi-object spectrograph in space and uh, uh, has been, uh, as I said, developed by, by ESA. Uh, the um, NIRIS uh, is uh, provided by the um, uh, Canadian Space Agency and is the imager and slitless spectrograph. And the NIRCAM uh, is the primary uh, imager in the near infrared region and is developed by their, uh, under the responsibility of the University of Arizona. And uh, Webb has a huge range, a very really large range of observing modes, 17 of them, and each of them has sub modes, I would say. And uh, these are summarized uh, in, the, in this chart, but if we want to focus now in the, in the imaging modes, uh, it essentially has uh, 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 cameras uh, which uh, have Pisces scales to properly sample the diffraction limited PSF at uh, several wavelengths uh, and uh, with a field of view up to nearly 10 arc, uh, arc minutes square and with a huge range of, uh, of filters from narrowband to, to broadband. It has also um, chronographic capabilities uh, all the way to uh, the mid infrared, uh, both with uh, NIRCAM and, uh, and MIRI. And, uh, and then uh, I think the, what is really fantastic about uh, Web is the huge range of spectroscopic modes. And this is uh, completely a, a big change with respect to Hubble because uh, with Hubble, uh, the emphasis was mostly on imaging and the spectroscopic follow-up was mostly done uh, through ground-based telescopes. Instead, uh, Webb will follow up its own sources with its own, uh, its own spectroscopic capabilities. And uh, it will be the first time that we will have integral field spectroscopy in this uh, wavelength range. Uh, similarly, uh, slit spectroscopy up to uh, five micron. Actually, also MIRI provides slit spectroscopy. Uh, there will be a mode for a single object slit spectroscopy, which is, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, specifically dedicated uh, to uh, transiting exoplanets, so this mode is uh, especially, especially for the, um, uh, specifically for the exoplanet community. And also, as I mentioned, we have uh, the first multi-object spectrograph in space with NIRSPEC, and this exploit a total a, a technology, the micro, this micro shutter array, which is developed, which was developed specifically for, uh, uh, for NIRSPEC, for web. And uh, this summarized the huge range of uh, spectroscopic modes uh, in, across the wavelength range and in terms of spectral resolution that will be available uh, for, um, uh, for with web. Uh, and what is really jaw-dropping, however, are the sensitivities of web. This because we are talking about a factor of several up to orders of magnitude higher sensitivity in some central band than what we uh, have currently or what we had in the past. And I will come back to this uh, later on because it's uh, really a key feature of, of web. Um, web is uh, a masterpiece of technology, no doubt. Uh, it uh, essentially has pushed technology to the boundaries of what is feasible. And this is just an uh, uh, incomplete list of cutting edge technologies that have been developed specifically for web and flow for the first time in space. And I won't go through them, but of course one that 
uh, we have or has been uh, uh, in the news continuously is the fact that we have been uh, sending, uh, deployed a telescope in space with over 300 single point of failure. And I think that many of us uh, were uh, nail baiting uh, until uh, January when we uh, finally were sure that the whole the system, the whole telescope and sun shield and so on were deployed. And uh, as I mentioned, in terms of space capability, in terms of science capability, we have uh, for the first time, uh, uh, multi-object spectroscopy in space, uh, the first uh, integral field spectroscopy in the, uh, across the entire uh, 1 to 28 micron uh, range, uh, new coronagraphic modes uh, all the way to the mid infrared, and also slit spectroscopy in this, uh, in this wavelength range. Um, where we are now, as you know, uh, the, we are at, after the telescope alignment and phasing, uh, we are at the very last few days of commissioning of the instruments, and we are all, of course, we are all looking forward, of course, for the first uh, the release of the um, early um, release observations on the July the 12th. And uh, uh, we, you have seen this fantastic image showing that all instruments are uh, well in focus, and uh, in terms of uh, science performances. Uh, I just uh, touch on uh, just a few aspects. The image quality is excellent and is essentially diffraction limited even at shorter wavelength than it was required. Web was required to be diffraction limited to micron and actually is, uh, is diffraction limited at even shorter wavelengths. And the circular energy is uh, well matching the expectation from the um, uh, pre launch. Uh, in terms of throughput is uh, equal or even better than expectation and is due to the fact that the mirror has been kept very clean until until launch and also thanks again to, to ESA also at the phase uh, during, um, before uh, the, that it managed to keep it, everything clean up to the uh, storing in, uh, in Ariane 5. And uh, the guiding, pointing and stability are generally excellent. In particular, the, you may know that the cryo cooler that is cooling uh, MIRI was a major, uh, well, it was a matter of concern because it, there was the fear that it would essentially affect the jitter or pointing and so on. Essentially is nearly unnoticeable. So again, a fantastic um, technological development for specifically for, for web. So um, web is, uh, I would say, is uh, performing uh, even beyond expectations in, in many aspects. There are some uh, uh, nuisances, uh, of course, as you expect from any new facility. There is a high incidence of transients that are larger than cosmic, uh, cosmic, cosmic rays, which is, um, those which are, we call snowballs. However, they affect uh, per second a fewer fraction of uh, pixels than regular cosmic rays. And there, is, there are some faint uh, stray light artifacts that uh, are seen in uh, some limited areas of near and, and nearest. And these are uh, due uh, very likely to very bright stars in some certain regions of, um, well away from the field of view. And there are tools which are being developed both to avoid these issues at the level of uh, when you prepare the observations, so uh, to avoid stars, bright stars being in some area of the um, uh, sky, and, uh, and also at the level of data processing. Uh, there was a presentation this morning by Massimo Stivelli, if you haven't heard that, but uh, we provide a more extended version of these uh, features that, uh, in terms of science performance. But overall, I would say that uh, it's fantastic that uh, web is essentially performing better than expected by uh, nearly uh, every measure. So it's, it's, I would say it's rare to have a completely new facility that is uh, overperforming with respect to um, expectations. Uh, in terms of commissioning, we are, uh, have commissioned the nearly uh, all instruments, uh, well, in nearly all modes, and uh, there are still uh, a, a few modes that still have to be uh, completed, and this chart, you can see this online, and uh, you can check what is the status. And uh, uh, while actually uh, the, the commissioning has been finished, actually cycle one observations uh, have already started because in between gaps of uh, uh, commissioning uh, steps, they uh, managed to sneak in, uh, how to say, uh, observing uh, scientific uh, observations. And you can actually go to the archive and you can see actually this observation which have already been performed. 
And uh, what uh, will be uh, observed in cycle one, the, this is a distribution of uh, proposals that have been uh, accepted in, in cycle one. As you see, most of the time has been given to galaxies and uh, IGM and exoplanets. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of instrument distribution, the, uh, it's interesting that the two instruments that have received the most requests and which have been recommended most are NISTEC and MID, which are the two European instruments. Um, if, you if you split the, uh, the allocated observing time and requested observing time across uh, observing modes, the interesting aspect is that 70% uh, of the time has been requested for the spectroscopy which reflects the fa this uh, fantastic uh, um, range of uh, spectroscopic modes that has been, is observed by, by, is offered by Webb. And in terms also of seniority, it's interesting to notice that uh, there's been a, a, a good uh, component of uh, junior uh, applications with the fraction, for instance, of students higher than uh, the, the applicants, of stu students' applicants, and uh, awarded time then in uh, HST cycle 28. So it's, 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 it goes in the good direction and it's a good sign. Uh, in terms of um, uh, time allocated to the different partners, you know that you may know that the requirement for ESA, since the ESA participation is much larger than in, in web than for uh, Hubble, the minimal requirements was that uh, over the lifetime of web, uh, ESA should have uh, uh, had uh, at least 15% of the time allocated to European um, observers. And uh, you see that in cycle one, this has certainly uh, been the case already with uh, actually over 30% of the time uh, uh, allocated to the, or about 30% of the time allocated to ESA affiliated uh, observers. Um, for cycle two, uh, just to mention that the call uh, will be really, uh, out in mid-November with the deadline of um, uh, 27th, uh, end of uh, January. Uh, and therefore, people will have time uh, to familiarize with the data since uh, the, uh, in, the, the first data will be released in two weeks until the time of, of the deadline. Uh, what are people, uh, have people asked to observe in, uh, in cycle one? Well, um, uh, web uh, unprecedented capability essentially enable uh, a broad range of science cases to be uh, explored and I don't have time to list all of them. I will just focus uh, on a few uh, cases, in particular one very popular uh, science case with Webb is of course the uh, detection and exploration of exoplanets. There are programs which aim at uh, imaging, directly imaging exoplanets by using the coronagraphic uh, modes, but uh, um, I will just focus here on the uh, spectroscopy of uh, detection of exoplanet atmosphere through transit spectroscopy. As an example here, you can see the uh, expected spectrum of uh, uh, this hot, hot Jupiter WASP um, 79B, which is, will be uh, essentially observed in one of the ERS program. And it's just jaw dropping that uh, thinking that you will obtain this kind of high quality spectra of uh, an exoplanet that is uh, in another solar system is uh, is just uh, uh, mind blowing. Uh, of course, uh, uh, actually, the bulk I think of the um, uh, request of observation is, is for smaller planets, and uh, many of these in uh, uh, sub-Neptune regime. And this is an example of uh, an exoplanet, which is uh, a sub-Neptune exoplanet in the habitable zone, which I think is the one which has requested, the lar has been allocated the largest amount of time in, in cycle one. And you can see the difference between the spectrum uh, obtained by, by Hubble with uh, what is expected with, uh, with Webb, where you will be able to detect uh, all kind of uh, molecular uh, features and therefore constrained models for the atmospheres and uh, um, the chemical composition of uh, the, the, the atmosphere. And of course, the ultimate goal is uh, to target uh, earth sized uh, planets in uh, the habitable zone. And these uh, simulations shows that by uh, with several tens of transits, you can actually uh, detect and uh, characterize also these atmospheres. 
And uh, as this was also discussed uh, much more in detail this morning, and you may see that if it is there, potentially also ozone can, uh, can be detected. Um, as I uh, been mentioned this morning, oh, sorry, this morning, earlier this, this afternoon, uh, it, it, the web will also, will also uh, explore the uh, protoplanetary disk where planets uh, uh, form, and uh, um, in particular the composition, and the excitation, and the inner regions where, uh, and uh, also the, the, the ISSs. I don't have time uh, to, to, to go through that, but uh, uh, Yvine uh, did a fantastic job this morning, for, uh, so again this morning, this early this afternoon, to uh, describe what you can do in, the, in this area. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, early universe, one of the goals of Webb will certainly be to explore the, the early star formation in galaxies, how mass has been assembled in galaxies, and the associated chemical enrichment. And of course, most uh, Cycle 1 programs focus beyond the cosmic noon and out to the uh, highest ratio. And how high? Well, it depends on now how um, collaborative is the universe, because essentially we are entering to the unknown uh, clearly here. And this is a, 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 a simulation of what we expect to see in the JACE program, which is the joint program uh, um, between the NIRCAM and NIRSPEC GTOs. And uh, this is a comparison of what uh, you, is, uh, is visible in the, uh, can be detected in the Hubble, but it's not the, um, actually the large, much larger number of galaxies that you can detect, but the fact that many of these uh, gal faint galaxies are actually at very high redshift, which couldn't be detected by, by Hubble, so there is great expectation there. And of course, again, the, uh, the, the, one of the main goals is to then characterize each of these galaxies and, uh, uh, with spectroscopy and uh, uh, with uh, um, trying to determine the chemical composition, uh, the stellar populations, uh, the, the presence of, of black holes, and uh, down to uh, a limited magnitude uh, that is uh, completely unfeasible from ground. So we are really exploring a totally, spectroscopically, a totally new regime with, with Webb. And as I mentioned, for many of these galaxies will be, and uh, distant sources, we will be able to obtain three-dimensional spectroscopic information thanks to the IFS capabilities. Uh, and I will uh, conclude by saying that uh, uh, hopefully none of these, uh, what I've discussed, uh, will be the, uh, the most exciting discoveries with Webb. We have to realize that uh, Webb really enable in a, a historical leap in, in, in sensitivity. In, in some bands uh, by even three orders of magnitude. I mean, this uh, has happened very real, rarely in the history of science. Just to put it in a context, context in the, in the, is equivalent in the optical to suddenly pass from Galileo's telescope to the modern large telescopes. So I like to think like uh, having uh, 400 years of discoveries compressed in uh, 10 or 20 years of operations uh, of web. And uh, I really hope that we are all like uh, uh, Galileo, very eager to know more, but clueless of what is uh, uh, to come. And I will finish by uh, quoting uh, Churchill, that, uh, saying that we are really approaching the end of the beginning, and by the beginning I mean the commissioning, and also quoting uh, the head of uh, um, commissioning, Scott Friedman, saying that uh, soon uh, JWST will be yours, and I would add to start uh, this new year of in a stormy. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto. Uh, some questions? Um, quick question on uh, on potential risks. What is the car? Oh, there's. No. I'm here. OK, thanks. <laughs> uh, can, you, can you comment on potential risks in that area uh, around L2? You, you know, there are, we have seen some news concerning some micro meteorites uh, uh, hitting the telescope. Is there, can you just comment also on redundancy of instruments in case there's a major, a little major impact? 
No, well, yes, as you have seen, uh, there, there is a lot of, as in most space missions, there is a lot of redundancy. For instance, uh, imaging uh, um, capabilities are both in nearest and uh, um, uh, in near cam, and uh, uh, similar, spectroscop similar spectroscopic uh, capabilities are in, in, in various instruments. Keep in mind, however, that. Uh, Okay, that, that uh, micrometeorite that was uh, um, publicized was particularly harsh, but uh, the, that uh, um, uh, web would undergo uh, micrometeorite impacts was totally expected, okay? And uh, there were expectations, I think, uh, of the order of uh, um, 16 per year. So it's, it was conceived to endure this kind of impacts. And of course, with time, this will have some effect on, uh, on the quality, on the performance of the telescope, but this is, uh, was totally expected and in, uh, um, in, uh, therefore we, we were prepared to that. And of course there are some, uh, um, uh, how to say, um, ideas of, uh, uh, to minimize these, uh, um, uh, these impacts when the telescope passed through showers of micrometeorites so that uh, this is, uh, doesn't affect too much the telescope. But these, anyhow, anyhow, are all things that were uh, expected. Okay, any more questions or comments? Thank you, very nice talk. Uh, can you quantify, in terms of uh, fuel saving, how perfect was the launch of the telescope? Yeah, uh, no, I can't because it's been assessed uh, in the sense that there has been it was a lot of saving, and uh, nearly for sure will extend the, li the life mission beyond the goal. The, I mean, the originally the requirement of the lifetime of the mission was uh, at least five years with a goal of ten, and very likely will go beyond this goal of ten. How much beyond? Uh, I I cannot say because it's been assessed de depending on. The, um, they are assessing how much uh, you need uh, essentially to, um, for the various operations. And uh, at that point, they, at some point, NASA will come out with a more firm assessment. But, of but I mean, that extension wouldn't be possible without these savings, right? So this is a major fact related with extension of the mission. Yes, I, I'm not sure I understand the, the question. I, I mean, if the extension wasn't planned, if the a launch were like, let's say. Yeah, well. Uh, that is unexpected, actually. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> I think we all have to thank ESA for such a perfect launch, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank, thanks, Roberto. Let's thank all the speakers of the afternoon. And <laughs>